Okay, so uh, I really would like to get into the uh, subject today. Uh, we started a couple of things last week in terms of books where we talked about that uh, and software uh, a little bit. Uh, so, uh, objective of course, I have to talk about this because at the end of the semester, as you know by now already, every class we do. Uh, I think it's called assessment. There are people who make money. Uh, we we'll get paid doing this kind of things. Of course, it's very valuable because we, we're, uh, we're out for EBIT accreditation. Without EBIT accreditation, your degree doesn't have value, uh, so it's important. Now, the way it works, I communicate to you what the objective of the course is. Okay? Uh, well, I'll talk about that. And actually, these are tied to what SME says that are mechanical uh, engineering students' learning outcomes and all that kind of stuff. Okay? So they will be assessing you at the end. It's not an assessment on me, okay? Uh, you want to assess me, go to uh, rate my professors and then you can say whatever you want. <laughs> and then I would have to pay $500 for your negative comment. <laughs> Is that really good? <laughs> yeah, there are people who are buying that. Uh, scam artists do that. I mean, it's a scam, but... Uh, yeah, one negative comment, $500. Really, really bad comment, $1,000. Uh, but anyway, the deal is when you do that survey, it's going to be based on this. So my job in this class, or the, the intent of this class, not me, the intent of this class is getting you to know these things, okay? So let's communicate. At the end of the semester, you should have uh, these uh, learning outcomes. So upon completion of the coursework, the student will know in detail fundamental micro-machining processes, positive lithography, negative lithography, metal deposition, etching, dry etching, wet etching such as lithography surface and bulk micro-machining. So some of them actually you will know at the end of the day, at the end of the class. Uh, and then you also need to know how to do a layout. So that's a 3D CAD, well, 2D CAD, it's a layout, uh, for mesh devices using some computer edit design programs, particularly Coventerware, not SolidWorks, okay? Uh, and then you populate, so this one of the uh, CAD files, then you populate a whole wafer with this layout. So that's one of the outcomes. Learning a software for uh, or mesh specific CAD. Okay? Uh, and then, third outcome is simulation of mesh devices. Finite elements, you have dead finite elements. Uh, but we do have to do our best. In terms of at least some of you uh, learning how to take a mesh device and maybe find a voltage distribution or a temperature distribution or do uh, Analysis. How did they find on that load? Uh, number four, engineering skills. Okay. Always pays me when my students graduate and the best job they get is a test of engineering. Uh, it's not bad. I mean, that the, the whole industry is built up when they hire you as a test engineer, you climb up. Design engineering is pretty, I wish everybody was doing design. Uh, it's prestigious, it's very exciting, uh, but of course you have to make a living. Uh, but our job is to train you as design engineers, not as engineers. Okay? Uh, as a design engineer, you have to have critical thinking in design. If you design a microfluidics channel, okay, what is the inlet? What is the outlet? What kind of shape will give me uh, more favorable velocity distribution? Okay? Uh, where should I put my electrodes for a maximum electric field and so on, okay? So these are the things that I call critical uh, engineering design, okay? Some of them specifically for mass devices. Even though they have a different ambition design, all that should have learned. So your ambition should be in design engineers, okay? Uh, you know, I mean, if you have the, the skill, eventually you're going to find a job which going to allow you to practice that. Anyway, so critical thinking in microengineering design, uh, fabrication, packaging, and testing. Testing eventually the critical thinking is what I want. And then understanding of micro scale uh, no micro scale physics. We have a whole chapter on this, a whole lecture, lecture four or five on scaling loss in micro devices. Why do spiders walk on water? How could they walk on water? If you look at that density, 
the density is high about water. I mean, you know, in microphysics, if your density is high about water, if an argument is found out, then you're going to sink, right? But spiders actually walk, or the, uh, all these small uh, insects. What do you think is that? Small attention. What attention? Uh, Suffocation. But how come suffocation does not apply to you? Oh, because uh, the amount of... You got suffocation. Well, that's true, but the surface area isn't large enough to compensate for the force given up. So the uh, force due to suffocation is much less than compared to your weight. Yeah. The, the human, the size, and all that kind of stuff. Now, the scale becomes different now. In, but however, for a spider or you know, this is sex walking with water, uh, the sensation is much higher than the weight. So all stuff that you've been thinking is now going to be turned upside down. Okay, forces that you thought would never make any difference will actually make a difference. Okay, uh, and then uh, and the other ones, of course, the application area, which I already started talking about. Okay, any questions? So at the end of the semester, you have to ask yourself, did I learn this? Okay? And then when you do the events uh, survey, that's what you have to answer. Oh, yeah, I did not learn. Uh, but I mean, of course, you got to be honest with yourself because that really correlates to the value of your degree. Any questions? Yes? Um, how deep are we going to go where um, high frequency components, uh, RF for wireless <laughs> devices? How deep do you want to go? Well, that's something that I am really interested in. So I think everybody should hate this guy. <laughs> he is here to complicate your life. I can do it on myself. Like you have to punish all the class. But like that. no, I like that. Uh, not much. Okay. Six eighty five, however. So this is for so it's a two series men's course, a five hundred level and a six hundred level course. Okay, five hundred level course, uh, just getting about five water with five times six eighty five. High frequency and all that kind of stuff. So the other part, I think we already talked about that, and I'll talk more as we go. Great distribution, midterm 45 percent, final design project 30 percent, homeworks 15, and you have 15 homeworks. You took it as a point. Uh, <laughs> and then there's a review paper which is uh, out of 10 percent. So we'll, we'll talk more about this as we go. Uh, office hours, oh, I should modify this. Uh, actually, office hours are Monday, okay? So, that, uh, so Monday, 2 o'clock until 7 o'clock. I'm the only weird professor who has office hours until 7. Uh, so if you're around 6.30, still, I work. So Monday, make sure. Uh, my own number, AI is 1.40. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about the uh, max definition, background, and all that kind of stuff. Now, this is where it starts. How many people have heard of Richard Feynman? Uh, actually, there's a part of the uh, Twitter account. Uh, some of you guys are on Twitter. It's a more adult type of social media. Uh, but sure. uh, but uh, anyway, uh, there was some stuff about him. So he was a very legendary physics teacher, uh, Professor uh, Kaldek. Now, more than the physics, actually, Mems, there was a talk that he gave in 1959. Okay? I like it so much that I, I, I repeat it uh, in every class, and that if you take any Mems class, anybody doing the Mems, uh, we kind of respect the guy, okay? Uh, visionary guy. Uh, so let me tell you, 1959. So uh, there were no Mems devices, there were no micro devices, there were no accelerometers, no gyros. Not even flash memory, any of these electronic devices. If you want to record your professors that time, then you have to have a crew of five people, okay? <laughs> so during that time, 1959, uh, so he had a talk. So I met society of physics, uh, he was a keynote speaker, and then he said, I would like to describe a field, scientific field, in which little has been done, but which an enormous amount can be done in principle. Okay. What I want to talk about is the problem of manipulating and controlling things on a small scale. So this is called actually a small talk. Uh, so because you're talking about small things. And people were not still following it. Okay, I'm, I'm talking about manipulating things at a smaller size. Of course we knew about molecules, all, all that kind of stuff. But what I have demonstrated is that there is a moon. Actually it's also called the plenty of room talk, the small talk, the plenty of room talk. So he said there is plenty of room. room that when you decrease the size of things in a practical way, uh, what, what I've demonstrated is that there is room 
that you can't decrease the size of things in a practical way. You can miniaturize things. You can miniaturize devices. You can miniaturize processes. Okay? I want to show that there is plenty of food. And then he talked about his vision. So essentially what he said was, look, in fact, he had a challenge. Uh, and I'm sure some of you may have heard of encyclopedia. It's like Wikipedia, except written down. <laughs> 26 volumes, uh, which uh, is a Britannica. Uh, do you know there were people in the summer that were making money, kids like you, when they were in high school, they were making money by selling stuff like that? Uh, but anyway, what kind of generation? So, four millennia, okay. Uh, so, what he said was take Encyclopedia Britannica, 26 volumes. But I could shrink that and put it in one centimeter by one centimeter device. So he hasn't, that was not then that time. Because remember, we don't have memory. So we couldn't write stuff uh, for a magnetic page and then read it back. But he said, from what I know about the basics of physics, there's nothing that prevents me from uh, you know, pulling this binary data and storing it and reading it back. And the binary data is going to be so small that you can think of all Encyclopedia Britannica. But he said, okay, I'll offer, I think that time was about 50,000 dollars So the first person who does that, you know, I'll uh, get the. Uh, I think it was uh, 18.4 months, 50,000. But here's the point. So it's very weird, actually. If you look at human civilization, uh, so there's always little progress, right? Uh, somebody makes uh, an invention, automobile, and uh, little innovation. But once in a while, you have uh, what we call a seminar invention, a major invention, which drastically opens up a whole new area. So the reason why I'm talking about this guy for five minutes is, with this vision, he made people think about a new area. Uh, then, of course, I think memories came and all that kind of stuff. So at that point, however, if you look at this, what he's talking about is actually manipulating. Uh, so let me see, controlling things from a small scale. Now, in his mind, what he was talking about was actually manipulating electrons, okay? Uh, so essentially, you're talking about memory and all that, so which means things that do not move, okay? Turn on, turn off, voltage up, voltage down, okay? But nothing moving, like we say in mechanical engineering, actually moving parts, okay? So, uh, but that, that inspired people to think of it along those lines, you know, TVs had, you know, this huge uh, tubes, uh, that was replaced by transistors and so on, which I'm going to come in a little while. Uh, so that started the semiconductor industry, which is a multi-trillion dollar industry right now. That's one of the in fact, largest industry uh, in terms of uh, sales volume, market cap, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but let's not even figure it out. Okay, look, we're manipulating uh, electrons and all that for memory. Uh, for writing things and then uh, doing uh, switching and all that kind of stuff, but can we actually have a moving part? So that's when the conductor moved into the support mess. Micro, electro, mechanical. So the mechanical part suggests that I'm moving things. Okay? So for that, you need a beam, you need a blade, you need a channel, you need a spring. So mechanical uh, components. Okay? Now, what happened later on, uh, later on was as people started manipulating these things, we realized some of the stuff that we work on, for example, life sciences, so we work on cells, DNA, and these small things, right? It turns out, I mean, if you've got this, uh, or I'll give you another, uh, another example. So from life sciences, DNA, cells, proteins, and all that kind of stuff. Now, uh, if you're looking at apples, what's the wavelength of light? Terahertz? Nanohertz. Anybody? Actually, somebody should correct me in the way I'm asking the question because light is made of seven. Four to seven hertz. Right? So, uh, you have blue light uh, on one end and then far and then. Uh, so, visible light, let's talk about red light. What's the wavelength of red light? 750. Not for yours. Good. Uh, blue? Uh, 400. Well, 400. 400. Yeah, 400. 
Now, what do you think that means? So if I want to manipulate light, doesn't it make sense if I have a device which, can, which is within that range? Right? So 685, that's what we do. Actually, we build, uh, we talk, we build also, and we talk about micrometers. So there are a million micrometers here. 1024 by 1024. So next time, uh, DMP TV. Have you guys bought TV or something? Not seen. I mean, uh, of course, MP have MCD and MDD on uh, it, but there is a DMP, digital light projection uh, type of TV. Especially the large, large ones, 56, 64 inches in size. So that's made by Texas Instruments. So that uses the so called micrometers. And these micrometers are extremely small. It's within about 700, 800. Micron. And they move. So the point is, if you want to manipulate, uh, for example, uh, if you want to manipulate light, so you should be around here. Uh, no, no, uh, what's nanometer? Uh, yeah, about 700 nanometers around here. Okay? If you want to manipulate cells, what do you think is the size of cells? They're not all the same size, but Somebody asked me, okay, give me a size of the cell. As an educated engineer, uh, highly educated person, what kind of number? Smaller than No, give me a number, man. You're an engineer. Smaller is not a number. Uh, give me a number. I'm not going to laugh. How about a whole thousand nanometers? Uh, thousand nanometers is 100 micron. Actually, not bad. Some weird Frankenstein cells. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, I think you asked probably maybe that long, but uh, that large. You said 100 micron. 1,000 nanometers, 100 micron. Uh, oh, no, no. <laughs> one, one micron. Uh, yeah, viruses could be that, but typically granular cells are about 20 micron. By the way, you can't say I'm an engineer and I don't know the size of cell. Okay. You are an engineer, you know numbers. <laughs> so it's like a doctor who doesn't know a normal blood, uh, blood pressure range, right? Uh, they can't get uh, so now, by the way, the answer was right here. So 10 to 20 micron range. So you want to manipulate cells. You want to capture bad cells in a cancer. So uh, some of the stuff that people do in terms of detecting uh, cancer stem cells or cancer cells and so on. You want to capture one of them, manipulate them, then you have to have a device or a channel within that range. Okay? So this idea, just a very broad idea, eventually found about the, you know, force of people, inspired people to think through these kind of things. Okay? And now we have devices which manipulate at these levels. Proteins. The field called proteomics. Uh, there are some other companies which do uh, stuff like that in San Diego, the biotech area. So they make these devices, actually, which are a form of a mass device which manipulate this. E. coli, red blood cells, light again. Okay? All right, any questions so far? Okay. So, what it means is, this micro devices that we're talking about in this class, micro electromechanical systems, are a natural fit for manipulating small particles. Okay? And it spans several physics, sound, ultrasound. Uh, piezo electricity, uh, electrostatics, magnetostatics, optics, uh, and also uh, chemical processes. Okay, uh, hybridization, uh, cell migration, filtration, and all that kind of stuff. So, in this class, I'll talk about only five major application areas. Okay, and one of them will include what I'm talking about, or what I mentioned to you. Now, uh, so in terms of formal definition, uh, so what we call micro devices should have sizes within one micron. And how much is one micron in terms of meters? How many meters is one micron? Depends on how many six meters, right? Okay, good. Uh, so devices which have feature sizes from one micron up to potentially two or three millimeters. I mean, the whole device could be about two or three millimeters. What's the thickness of your hair? Six micron. Hundred micron. Yeah, good. Uh, hundred to two hundred microns. Okay. So <laughs> one 
hundredth of the thickness of your hair. Okay, that's a small, a smaller size of a device, all the way to two millimeters. Two millimeters is nothing. Okay, so those kind of devices are what we cover in micro uh, MEMS devices. Now, MEMS, of course, when you expand it, micro electromechanical systems. Uh, the fact that the, we're using the word electromechanical says we're using electrical forces, huh? and we also have mechanical uh, parts. Uh, when we say mechanical parts, actually stuff that moves. That's what we play. Spring, right low, so on. Uh, and then the fact that we say system shows that there is integration. Integration of functionality, integration of components. Okay? Typically, we don't want to integrate components, but integration of functionalities. Uh, and I'll come back to that uh, later on. Uh, yeah, well, some of you say, go oh, in Japan, uh, they use for uh, micro device, micro machines. In fact, there are some journals. They simple the micro uh, machines that it's kind of died. Uh, in Europe, they used to call them microsystems technology, MSC, but not, not, not anymore. So pretty much, uh, MEMS is a general term that we use. Okay. Five classes of MEMS. Okay? Uh, at least as far as this class is concerned, there may be one or two additional ones, but uh, it's a 500 level course, a first introduction to MEMS. So I have, we have five types. So the first one is inertia system. I think some last week. Uh, so when we say inertia systems, so essentially we're talking about systems that help you detect motion, the air motion as well as motion. Right? So Ryan, give me an example of an inertia system. Inertia system. Inertia system. Okay. So man's device that works. Inertia. Yeah. So we have it actually here. So speed. Well, that is speed. Okay, what's the other one? Gyros. Uh, so, accelerometers, gyroscopes fall under this group. In fact, they were the first commercially successful application of MEMS. Okay? Uh, airbag. Uh, deployment of your airbag in your hard works. Anybody? Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, so it senses, right? So the accelerometer has to sense, I mean, it's going to deploy only if you're hit. Uh, and as soon as you're hit, then the accelerometer detects that uh, force. So the accelerometer, uh, proof mass is going to move. So that's going to uh, initiate the electronics, saying, okay, deploy. Yeah, okay, so uh, this is a lot of life and very simple concept. So the first series of applications were there for, I mean, from a commercial point of view, okay? Uh, inertia systems. Uh, and your product has several of these. Uh, now that most of the data is the gyro, anti rolling, uh, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then, so you can have it uh, from a consumer electronics point of view. Uh, iPhone 6, uh, no, no, iPhone, uh, I think the first one was iPhone 3 or 4, which have some of the basic uh, MEMS devices. Now iPhone 10 or X, uh, I think, has six accelerometers and gyro and all that kind of stuff. Okay? Uh, so, uh, I mean, each of you is walking around with MEMS devices. Okay? Whether you realize it or not. Okay, now, second one is optical system. And I told you why it's a very natural fit, because the wavelength of light is within uh, the dimension that we're talking about. So an optical lens, if you forget anything else, remember this. 100% of the projector market, okay? We're not even talking about 50 or 60 or 90. 100%. Absolutely, you want to buy a projector, it has to have a mass mirror. Okay? Uh, I don't know about the picture here. No. Uh, I'll show you some of this. You have some of the slide. Uh, but you have this 1024 by 1024. 1024 rows, 1024 columns. That's like more than the power six mirrors. It's a very interesting physics. Right now, I change the slide. 
Some of them are dark, some of them have light. So the mirrors are engaged right now. But it's funny. They don't consume that much power after they're engaged. There's a property called hysteresis, and we do that actually in the 685. I love, uh, I love that aspect of that. Uh, now, uh, again, in the movies, uh, they damage, in fact, even in movies, actually, it's 100%. All this larger projections, 100% is dominated by micrometers, MEMSI devices. Uh, TV is where LED and LCD, uh, you know, has a good uh, market share. Um, so, uh, they are also integrating this into the new um, 4K laser TVs? Uh, well, so what's the underlying technology, right, in terms of the display, right? So if it's LCD or LED, like, you know, uh, for example, Samsung uh, is completely in a bullet, foldable, curved, all that kind of stuff, so that happened with LED technology. LED is different, so essentially you have these uh, photo emitting uh, uh, chemicals, so it's light emitting diodes, right? So uh, they have no moving parts. Okay, so the underlying technology is different. But with this, it's mirrors opening to a certain, uh, well, I mean, you could have you know, a billion or you know, whatever scale that you want. Uh, and it just works by switching mirrors on and off. And of course you have to use a filter. So, uh, I think we may discuss, no, uh, we may have one class, one have to come so we'll see. Uh, but, in certain segments of uh, optical application, up to 100% uh, penetration. It's incredible. Uh, the other, the third one is BioMEMS, which is just expanding like crazy. Uh, in fact, most of the innovations that are going to happen will happen in bio. Uh, there's a lot of interest, uh, both academic and industry. Uh, and I gave you the example of 23andMe. Uh, a few years ago, you know, very few people knew about them. Uh, even though Illumina has been around for <laughs> since 1990. 2000, some of you were not born maybe. Probably were born. Uh, but they've been around. But uh, the market was not aware of these kind of things, and finally the culture caught up with this, and uh, they make money, uh, and they dominate the market. Uh, so, in terms of gene sequencing, DNA sequencing, okay? Identifying a DNA sequence for a million, so... Uh, then there's another group where uh, we talk about lab on a chip. A whole... You know, the biggest problem with real labs uh, if you've got their cost, it's the uh, reagents. They consume a lot of reagents. I know that because I'm running my lab. It's, most of my cost is not people. I don't want to say it. Labor is cheap. <coughs> uh, material is expensive. In, in this industry. Uh, so $3,000 like that. And if I undergrad for $3,000, they'll be happy. I mean. uh, but some of the chemicals cost uh, a lot of money. So, how do you do some of this interesting chemistry or whatever, if you're doing a drug discovery. Instead of doing a large scale and then spending all that kind of money, could you miniaturize things? And also, I could parallel them out. If I have a miniaturized one, I could test drug one in this condition, drug two in this condition, everything on a desktop. Okay? So it's cheaper. Uh, so there are examples on that. So BioMem is a huge application. Uh, actually, one of the startup companies I used to work, now it's no more, around. Uh, was making this DNA chip. I don't know if I have the picture here. Oh yeah, there's, that's our chip. Uh, it's a microfluidics problem. In fact, we hired one guy. I remember a PhD from UCLA. Uh, his job was actually avoid, I mean, design this channel so that there's no bubble. Bubbles are extremely bad uh, in microfluidics. Uh, so he had a six degree polynomial. Well, actually, he was just making it up. Uh, if you were smart, uh, you can play around with people. Uh, so, <laughs> but anyway, I mean, he made it work. But now for the kind of uh, number of order of magnitude that you're so glad. But anyway, microfluidics, okay? Uh, the next one, I uh, forgot your name. Omar. Omar. RF devices. RF devices in terms of the market, because the, uh, well, it's still okay, but in terms of penetration, huge opportunities still remain, okay? So some of the examples are typical of switch, on and off, uh, in RF uh, channels. 
uh, trans receivers, relays, uh, and so on. Okay. Uh, the next one is in terms of power microsystems. So if you search uh, under MEMS and Sandia, S A N D I A, Sandia. Are you okay? Uh, so Sandia is actually a national um, a government lab. Uh, anybody? At least tell me the state where Sandia lab is. It's in Livermore, right? Well, Livermore is up in the, the Bay Area. Yeah, yeah, Bay Area. Uh, but uh, Sandia is not in the, uh, the Bay Area. Yeah. Which state? There's one in Livermore. Yeah, there is. It might be a different one. No, Sandia. Uh, well, yeah, Sandia lab is actually in New Mexico. No, I mean, they may have presence in the Bay Area, but uh, so Bay Area, Livermore, which is operated by UC Berkeley and Stanford, but the Sandia's lab, so they were among the first ones who do uh, MEMS devices, so they have the process of a large uh, manufacturing facility, but their claim to fame is they made a lot of interesting videos at the beginning. Uh, we're talking about about 15 years ago. So whenever you search under MEMS devices and cool videos, uh, Usually, uh, MEMS devices that were fabricated by Sandia will show up. So they had actually runtime cycle. Does anybody take 495? I used to teach that class. So all that manual was written by me. So it's not coming. <laughs> so all the typos are due to me. Now don't tell them that. <laughs> so are you going to remove it from that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Nobody, nobody else will be in you. <laughs> so remember our uh, disclosure, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, anyway, power systems in terms of run kind cycle, uh, nice moving gears. Uh, I may have some of the images actually. Uh, so people struggle with that, but the problem with that was scaling logs. Got the problem. They scale terrible. So this run kind cycle in terms of the combustion or whatever that you're doing, uh, anything that involves uh, thermodynamics, okay? Scales terribly. When you go down in terms of length, it reduces much faster. On the other hand, electric field. When you go down in length, the electric field actually increases because of gradient. Same thing with magnetics, but not as fast as. Uh, so we're going to cover this. Actually, that's my, one of my favorite uh, topics because it really brings everything in per into perspective. Why when you miniaturize, you don't want to do a <laughs> terrible IC kind of stuff. Electro uh, electrostatics, uh, microdynamics, uh, even uh, ultrasound becomes uh, a better scanner. Anyway, uh, some kind of solar cell, you could classify them as uh, MEMS devices. Any questions? OK, so let's talk about the uh, history of this. So what I want you to do with, with this actually, I want you to go through it. But uh, just to give you uh, a perspective, okay? I remember uh, Feynman's talk, 1959. <laughs> that was around uh, the, the birth of IC technology. Well, that time they didn't even call it the IC, okay? Uh, but anyway, 1950, they found out if you take silicon, okay? And you put potassium hydroxide to it, and it's going to etch in a certain angle. Actually, it turns out it's 56.7 degrees. Uh, and then, uh, once it etches, actually, you could make membranes. Not only that, you could also. Uh, so, uh, people have known that I mean, you could take silicon and then you drop it, okay? Uh, with uh, boron, for example. Uh, then you could make it, uh, you could have, uh, you could make it any type, so it's, uh, or phosphorus, okay? So if you do phosphorus, it becomes any type, a lot of electrons. Uh, if you dope it with boron, then it's going to have less of electrons, therefore more of holes. So people discovered that around 1950. That's why the semiconductor thing came in, okay? Uh, but they figured out, if I put potassium hydroxide to silicon, actually it's going to etch it and then I'm going to get a membrane. <coughs> So what's the deal with a membrane? So if you have a structure, you could make a membrane. From an electrical point of view, it's not interesting. But if you are an ME, the moment you see a 
and then they want DFC. For example, the Hummer sees names, right? On Amy sees on the name, and what does he see? Or she sees. Possibly. You are part of the channel. Right? That's what I said. Which is good, okay? That's not wrong. Okay? <laughs> Many channel, yeah, okay. Uh, so you can use a uh, pumping, okay, good. You're saying, hey. Yeah, so you have if you have a method, uh, you put air into it, it's going to deflect, right? Okay, if I kind of make it in such a way that when it's deflecting, it changes resistance, don't have a pressure gauge right there. So the fact it's moving actually gives you a pressure gauge. Very cheap. Some of them are so cheap that they will ship it to you every few months. Actually. Because they are so cheap. Uh, so this was actually very interesting in terms of MEMS, so the fact that you could create membranes. You etch it, you get membranes, and actually that membrane could be attached to the rest of the electronics. I could make it piezo resistive, and we'll come back to that. Then I could detect that motion and then convert it into uh, pressure. Okay, uh, then actually the, uh, these guys, it's a beautiful story, 1958, the uh, birth of IC technology. Uh, what do you think the first, well, when we say IC technology, it means integrated circuits, okay? When we say integrated circuits, it means, have you guys seen breadboard? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you're out doing all the stuff, you buy one component, you buy another one, you put them together, and then you're uh, soldering, and then you connect it, okay? So that might integrate. But imagine if you make a process where you have a silicon and the resistor, the switch, uh, the capacitor, everything is in one unit, and they're all connected. So that's what we call integrated circuit. Okay, I covered that more in uh, 685, but I may also cover it over here. So that's where actually we changed the trajectory of uh, the industry. Okay, so that happened in two places. Okay. One is in a company called Fairchild. Have you guys heard of this company called Fairchild? So there's a very interesting movie. Uh, they bring it once in a while. Uh, public TV shows that about the birth of uh, semiconductor technology. Okay. All these guys, you know, wrote an article that you guys might be interested about it. But so that that has a real. Uh, very impressive one. So it's these guys actually. So semiconductor technology is about, I don't know, four, five trillion. Uh, so the US economy is 16 trillion every year. Uh, semiconductor is about four to five. Okay? If semiconductor was a country, it would be the third largest country. China is about eight trillion. Uh, so this was enabled in two places. One was in a company called Fairchild. Up in the area, that's what it's on. Uh, later on, it became one of the large, I mean, the, the largest semiconductor company on the planet. So you guys should be able to answer this. Anybody? Anybody from Northern California? No, nobody. Nobody comes from. Uh, the largest semiconductor company on the planet in terms of volume of uh, cells. Come on, guys. Intel inside. Intel. <laughs> right? So, uh, Intel, uh, so anyway, Fairchild became Intel. So these guys, uh, particularly this guy, uh, Robert Noyce. Uh, so that's what I, I mean, if you go to uh, YouTube and you have uh, time, I just search under these guys and watch that movie, okay? I mean, the whole, uh, the, the, their story is very interesting. Uh, but independently, these guys are Tex uh, Texas Instruments. What is Texas Instruments? Okay. It's a trick question. <laughs> You'll be surprised if you miss that. Uh, of course, it's Texas. Uh, it's a semiconductor company. It's not the largest. But they have a very good... In fact, micrometer technology came from there. Uh, they independently also developed uh, IC technology. Now, the next uh, progress was 1965 when somebody built actually what's called surface micromachining, and I'll talk about that. Uh, somebody built a transistor. Okay, the next, I mean, you could go and read here, but the university-wise, uh, the first pressure sensors were 1970. 
You guys may not remember 1970, but uh, <laughs> uh, I do remember. Uh, it's not very far, okay? Uh, so the first pressure, pressure sensors, 1917. In the 80s, uh, it was kind of getting, you know, the bigger universities and so on. Uh, so when was the first commercial product? Uh, 1987. Where, where's sacrificial layers? Uh, what? Sacrificial layers? Yeah, in fact, the whole basic business is you could have there. Yeah, we'll come back there. But anyway, so what I want you to do is I want you to read this so that it gives you a perspective. Okay? It's an area with just progressing. Uh, and it's not old, it's very new. Now, one of the weird things that I teach in this class is about market. It's not really in this class, actually, if you take 685 from the design. Uh, if you're already working on an RF chip and all that, you don't need to worry about market. I mean, because the market is already there. Uh, but in MEMS, you know, you can have the, the best ideas, but eventually you have to set up a function, right? Uh, so, for a technology to prosper and to dominate, you have to have a market share. Okay? And this graph tells you where the market is headed. And let me ask this question so that you guys get a perspective. So if you have to guess the total annual steps one US dollars and then the device, what would that be? Um, total annual globally? Globally, of mass devices. So remember the five categories that I gave you, uh, yeah. temperature sensors, microfluidics. I guess 50 million, if it's greater. It's not bad, yes, right there. Yeah. I thought the answer is right there. 24.5. Would you give? You're not very far. Right. Uh, so right now we're at 25 million, almost 25 million. What? No, we're not even that. That's 20, 24. So we're here, which is about $18, $20 billion. Well, well, probably even less than that, about $15 million. Actually, this is very conservative. Uh, this is a little bit conservative because, yeah, yeah, this is more accurate in my opinion. Because this one, if you look at it, 2018, well, it depends on your definition, OK? So uh, pressure sensors, uh, inkjet printers, and all that. Uh, these guys did not include them, but this interpretation includes that as a mass device. Uh, just like everything else, that's controversy in terms of what you put in the ADA doesn't make controversy. Okay? Uh, so let's add this number, let's add that number. Now, next time actually I will make this guy larger than that. Except the problem is this one ended in 2018, the projection that we're already in 2019. My point, or in 2019, we're about 22 billion according to this. So 2024, with 13% increase, that's a cumulative. CAGR, that's an MBA term, anybody? Cumulative growth rate, I, I forgot about the age. Un, uh, yeah, un unwalized growth rate. Uh, 13%. It just means growth rate. Right? Uh, so with 13%, so by 2024, 25, I would suspect with this kind of interpretation, up to $50 billion. Uh, so that's a market size, okay? Out of which, of course, some of them are automotive, uh, medical, and all that. But uh, we'll cover this later. So questions before we move on. So I need the class to be dynamic. It's not only me talking on a Friday. Right? Uh, okay, so how about microfabrication capabilities uh, in uh, San Diego State? Now, I'm very proud to tell you that not every university in the United States has a program in maps. Okay? Not every university in the United States has a community. Okay? Uh, they may have uh, actually, uh, what are called modular units, which you could buy twenty twenty-five thousand dollars, which we did before. Uh, but really, something designed from the ground up. So in San Diego State University, so you guys will be there. Actually, eventually at the end of the uh, semester, everybody will be trained. Uh, you will be in, and you know uh, we'll do that. And that's why I had to get rid of a number of people last week in terms of capacity. Even then, I mean, handling this number of people. I mean, it costs me money, right, by the way. Uh, so a couple of years ago, people were saying, our oh, blessed dean, God bless his soul, uh, he was saying, we should charge for this class. Another 35 or 50 bucks and all that. But I said, I'll, I'll, I'll absorb the uh, cost. Uh, but the point is, 
We have a class 1,000 clean room, about 2,000 square feet. Uh, we have every equipment except what's called e-beam lithography, which allows you to go to extremely small features, uh, but that's in the plan. Uh, so you could do deep UV lethal uh, and all that kind of stuff. At one point, actually, we had a laser system that was uh, donated to us by Cyber. Have you guys heard of a company called Cyber? Uh, now they're bought by SML. Uh, so they gave me this huge stuff, but maintaining that uh, required a lot of money. So anyway, eventually I got rid of it. I'm kind of curious. Do they use UV lasers in these systems because of the short wavelength and yeah. the energy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, that's a very good question because I, may, I have a slide on that one actually. We'll talk about that. So it's all about the exposure. What the, the minimum feature size that you make depends on what light I'm using to make those features. Large wavelength, large feature sizes. You want to go to 12 nanometer, uh, not 11 nanometer, that's the current state right now, and it's happening in San Diego right now. So two companies that you have to know in San Diego, whether you work for them or not, like I said, Illumina in terms of life science, really impacting everybody's and causing a lot of family friction. Uh, so that's number one, Illumina, okay? Uh, number two, SML. So they are the ones actually who are enabling the smallest feature size, which is 11 nanometers, okay? And the deal is that UV light, deep UV light, they could, in a repetitive manner, uh, have emit an 11 nanometer wavelength. So we'll come back to that. But uh, anyway, in terms of the facility that we have, uh, so we got pretty much of, uh, everything that we did, except EV, like I said. And at the end, everybody will be trained, at least doing a positive lithography, and maybe a negative lithography, okay? All right, any questions? Yes? How much of uh, the semester is going to be hands on the lab, and how much is going to be in class? Ideally, okay, if I was running this class, if I had about 30 people, or 30 people, or 35 people, then it would be a lot of hands on uh, class. From my perspective, okay, from a size point of view. However, with this kind of large scale, uh, and then with the cost, if I've done the number every time somebody steps into a clean room in an hour, I mean, it costs me about 50 something bucks uh, with the chemicals and all that kind of stuff. So, with the scale, so we limit it. But I'm surprised every semester because I, I mean, if you like it, then you know, you do things, right? Uh, so because of that, at the end, we'll make sure that everybody gets uh, some kind of uh, experience. So you're going to spend that at least <laughs> 7 to 10 hours in the clean throughout the semester, which is, which is decent. If you go to UCSD, and I'll guarantee you, talk to your friends if you know them. The majority of them have never even been in the clean room. They will kill them today. <laughs> Even if they dare to watch it. Uh, because, I mean, there's so much barrier. Uh, so, that, you know, that's one aspect. The other aspect is, of course, this is a 500 level course. Uh, in addition to the hands-on, we need to educate you about like, scanning laws and this and that. So, I have to balance it. And I'm, I'm very happy, actually. At the end, uh, we have a good product. Uh, so, from my perspective, it seems to work. And then students come back to me at the but anyway, you will not be disappointed. Now that we scared the weak. <laughs> and I'm believing what? Okay. Uh, so one thing uh, I want to mention, so there's a difference between NEMS and nanotechnology. You may have heard of this. Uh, the word nanotechnology is being used in a number of places. The fact that it's nano, it means uh, it's, uh, one thousandth of a micron, uh, but it's a little bit different. So when you, you don't actually don't make a device with nanotechnology, so you, sometimes what happens is if you want a T-shirt that's uh, waterproof, so waterproofing uh, powder, for example, that's nanotechnology. They have a, you know small beads and then you coat them, and they are uh, hydrophobic. They don't like water, so water just close on them, uh, or if you want to make shirts that do not need to be ironed, uh, we could do that. Uh, that's nanotechnology, but that's not a, a device, okay? MEMS is different. MEMS, you're making a, a movable micro-electromechanical device. 
So if somebody asks you, uh, okay, did you take a nanotechnology course, they'll say ME585. Okay? All right. Okay, this brings me to one of my favorite slides. Have you guys heard of Moore's Law? Mm -hmm. Right? Every 18 months, the power of a transistor doubles, or the amount of circuits that you can put in a given size doubles. Uh, that's called Moore's Law. Okay? Well, we're going to come back to that story. That's why I'm telling a story. <laughs> and thanks for interrupting. Like, no, no, I, I like the engagement. It's good. Uh, but yeah, but that's what happened, so uh, I'll tell you why. Remember the uh, Fairchild guy told you about IC technology? What's his name? Huh? Jack Kirby? No, 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 noise, noise. Jack Kirby of the Texas Instrument guy. Noise and Moore actually used to work together in Fairchild. Uh, but then uh, Moore went, uh, they left Fairchild. Fairchild is still in San Jose, actually. It's a smaller place. Uh, next time you go, you go to uh, the Bay Area, I mean, visit Tesla. Uh, also visit some of these. I mean, just don't go to Facebook only and then they come back. But that's not really where it started, I mean, uh, the other places. Uh, so this guy co-founded uh, Intel. Okay? And he's so much respected, and in fact, he had a paper, and then I just saw a clip of the paper. Oh, yeah. Uh, but anyway, he had a paper, and he said, you know, I mean, they, they knew how, how fast the technology was going, and he said, okay, look, the way we're going every 18 months, uh, we're putting more circuits in the uh, chip, and it's becoming more powerful. So there are some that, that, uh, interpretation of the same law, but the whole idea is every 18 months, good things happen. It was doing good until, what, 2005 and so on. Then 18 months, nothing happening. Now, like I, I told, there are several interpretations of this. One of the interpretations is the minimum feature size that you could put in terms of a wire, okay? Because the older circuits, one wire was thick. It's a millimeter thick. So transistor is a millimeter thick. So you want to make a smaller one, then you go to one tenth of a millimeter, one hundredth of a millimeter, one thousandth of a millimeter. So you decrease the feature size. Okay? So this interpretation is based on that. So several years ago, we were here, millimeters and all that. Then we went to 45 nanometer. Now, in our lab, we could do 200 nanometer. I don't need 20 nanometer. Uh, first of all, it's expensive. I mean, the, the, just the controller uh, <laughs> and then the UV light source. And I've gone to a, a SML, and some of you will work over there, and you'll see. Uh, just the UV light source room is this big. And then you need a huge uh, seismic isolator at the bottom. And it just becomes huge. You cannot maintain that. Uh, so we don't, we don't need that kind of feature size, so 200 is good enough for us. But if you are intelligent and you're, uh, and then you're Samsung, uh, you want to go to the next uh, powerful device, then you have to be operate. You have to be operating at this level. Right now, we're at 11 nanometer. Commercials, like, okay? Some people have shown seven nanometer IBM a couple of years ago, but it's not commercial, just one, one shot. But once we were here, it became really, really difficult to go to the next level, okay? Because it all depends on the light source that you're using. And that really required innovation. And it turns out, actually, the innovation came from San Diego. Uh, there's this company called, like I said, Simer. Uh, that was started by uh, our sister uh, uh, institution. Uh, they, I mean, they were the producers of laser source. But from laser, then they went into UV light source. And at one point, they were actually able to get the 11 nanometer once in a while. But that was about 12 years ago, I think. Then stabilizing that and making sure it happens. So some of you guys will be writing a review paper. I mean, all of you will be writing a review paper, by the way. It's one of the requirements of this class. So I, this would be a nice story. Uh, 
how they achieved that. Now, it's based on the public information, okay? Uh, the non-public one, I mean, you have to take it up for a beer, and then, I mean, they don't talk until the fifth beer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, uh, so how to make that sustainable? That 11 nanometer emission of UV, uh, it's called actually extreme UV light, okay? Uh, so about two years ago, they figured that one out, okay? And uh, so the demand is huge. Demand, they were hiring left and right, uh, you guys know. Now I think they slowed down, I don't know. Uh, but at one point, they had to deliver 120 something units. And each unit is about $75 million. This is before the NBA people come in with a service contract and then this and that. At the end, before you know it, they have separated you from $300 million for one unit. Uh, so they have to be a hundred of these. Uh, so they hire everybody. In fact, from our lab, we have four, four people, four or five people, actually, from our lab were hired. Uh, so now it's becoming interesting. They got the 11 nanometer. Now, from 11 nanometer, how do we go to the next one? So as you can see, the projection by wars, okay, every 18 months, kind of flat, that's what we were saying. It went flat. Uh, then now, eventually, yeah, you see some interesting aspect. Now, how do we go from here to the next level? Uh, because every time we will try and pack more stuff, right? Uh, so there are different approaches that people are uh, looking at. In fact, one of them was using after DNA, human DNA. Uh, we did that in our lab about six, seven years ago. Uh, uh, then actually using a synthetic DNA, also DNA with some kind of metal, some kind of stuff. Uh, so that will take you about six. Uh, now, because DNA is, what, what do you think is the width of DNA? Fractions, single DNA. You see, this is where biology and engineering interface. Two nanometers. So if I could take a DNA and turn it into a wire, so I am, so every 18 months it's doubling, right? Or halving. So you go to uh, the next one, which is five, then, so you have about two generations. Uh, so that's where a, a, a majority of the invention and the majority of the money is trying to go in, okay? Uh, so a lot of people see challenge, which challenge means opportunity. So, questions? Yes. So what's the theoretical minimum width before the electrons start leaking, and then once you kind of Good approach question. that like upper echelon of a limit, what's the next? So there are arguments about 20 nanometer. Uh, so, but with a proper design, instead of uh, uh, a 20 nanometer, then there's a cost talk and all that. Uh, but with proper design, shelving and all that, you could go all the way to 5 nanometers. Now, going further is where it becomes really interesting. Well, I don't think it's the same thing. I mean, it's just the architecture is different, but eventually you need wires, right? So, uh, quantum computing is more of an architecture issue, not, not a device issue. But you know, that's a good thing. I want you guys to think along that line. So, questions? Okay. Now, uh, so what I would like to do is uh, I would like to cover some of the, uh, the five application areas to a little bit, uh, a little bit of depth. So, the first one is uh, accelerators and gyros, also known as IMU, inertial mass. Uh, measurement, well, inertia measurement units, okay? Uh, so how does an accelerometer work? So this actually, believe it or not, is the moving path component of an accelerometer, okay? So the first accelerometer, the commercial accelerometer was called ADXM50, it's this guy. However, the MEMS component is only this guy over here. I put it. In fact, I should have expanded the view. So if you take this guy, expand it, you get this. The remaining parts are the circuits, the electronics. Okay? The moving part, the MEMS part is this guy. Now, let's expand that view. And what you see is. This part, which is what we call a proof mass. Some kind of plate has to have a mass, some kind of mass. Okay? Now, this mass 
will have fingers, which are electrodes, actually, going both ways. So if you look at this, there are fingers that go out of the poop mass. On the other hand, so these are removable fingers or electrodes. Okay. On the other hand, over here I have other sets of fingers which are fixed. They're fixed to the bottom. So you can see. So whenever you see this rectangle, that tells you it's fixed. Uh, so I actually have two series of these guys. So these are the fixed electrodes. Now, the same thing on the other side. What happens is a few hits the same, either this way or that way. So let's assume, uh, yeah, this way. Okay. If you hit this, uh, if you set it into motion in the other in that direction, what happens is you have the movable fingers coming from the proof mass, and these are the fixed fingers, and the distance changes. Now, there's a small electric bias on this electrodes. Another small electro bias on this one. So let's assume that this is ground and this is maybe 0 0.5 volt or 1 volt. Okay? So what do you think happens? Now let's think electrical. So two plates. One goes this way, but the other one's staying. But this guy is moving in and out. Some electrical properties changing. Now the voltage is constant. Resistance is also constant. Capacitors. Capacitance is changing. C. You guys remember? Even in high school, capacitance is epsilon zero times A divided by D, right? Uh, times uh, delta V. Okay. So, if the capacitance changes, then could I correlate that capacitance change to a change in location? So when it's not moving, when it's overlapping here, the capacitance is C0, which I know. But that's moving, it becomes C1. So C1 minus C0 could be correlated to a displacement. Okay, now, there's a circuit which converts change in capacitance into change in voltage. Now, before I say that, let me make this point. I don't know if Nurani emphasizes this point in ME495 when I was teaching that class. Mechanical measurements, remember lecture one, lecture two, and all that? So in mechanical measurement, the basic concept right now is any mechanical quantity, displacement, vibration, temperature, has to be transduced, has to be changed into an electrical quantity, preferably voltage. Right? That's how a thermal couple works. You raise the temperature, then the electromotive force changes, then you just read delta V. Delta V is the easiest thing to measure. Okay? You can go to Fry's, five bucks, nine bucks, you can buy a voltmeter, multimeter. You can measure that. So remember, any mechanical quantity, you want to measure a few changes into delta V, everything is solved. Now let me come back to this. So that change in capacitance, I would like to turn it into change in voltage because I can read it. So there are circuits over here. That will take the change in capacitance convert to uh, delta V, and then from delta V, of course, correlated to uh, displacement. So, what's the circuit? The name of the circuit that takes a change in capacitance and converts it into a change in voltage. No, it's not a transistor. Huh? No. So, Wheatstone is interesting, but except Wheatstone takes change in electrical resistance and converts it into a uh, well, there's another circuit. I can't remember the name of the chip. Isn't it a... Up. 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 Amplify. Okay. So it takes a change in capacitance. So we have an up amplifier here. It takes a change in capacitance, converts it to a change in displacement. Okay. Then I know. So as your airbag, that's what happens. There's a movement. Then the up amplifier detects that, and the electronics is distracted to the servo, and it deploys your airbag. Very basic concept. Now, the only thing I want to add here 
So the proof mass actually when it deflects, it needs a spring. Okay? So you have a proof mass and you have the electrodes, but there's a mechanical part that you need. So this guy has to be suspended from the floor, which is the silicon, but it has to be suspended through these beams, the springs. And a lot of thought goes into the design of the springs. You look at this guy. You see this nice spring? So if you have a Samsung uh, Galaxy, you could open it up, break it. Uh, remember, this is very small, it's about a millimeter by a millimeter. You can't see it. But there's a company in, uh, I mean, there are companies which make money this way. Have you guys uh, heard of Skunk Works? Skunk Works? Which planet do you guys live? <laughs> So uh, these are former military people. I mean, when it started, it started that way. So they do reverse engineering. Uh, SR seventy one, Blackbird. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think there's one James Bond movie on that. But anyway, Scott works. I think that right now the way they make money, they take this. Uh, the moment I iPhone X came, they took it, opened it up, because Apple is not going to share their secret to you. It's a seven hundred billion dollar company, right? Uh, so what you have to do is you have to open it up and uh, take X-ray, SCM, sky electromicroscope, and then actually send the report for a thousand dollars. They will charge you back. So, uh, but anyway, uh, so this images are available. Now, what I wanted to show you was look at the design of that beam. It's a spring. So one of the things I like about MEMS is the uh, people who were doing MEMS at the beginning were typically electrical engineers. But some of them, uh, some of them were so smart, I mean, they were not trained, I mean, they never took statics. Okay? They never took mechanics of solids. Okay, what do you call it again? You guys don't remember this one? Take over the... Mechanics of solids. No, the mechanics of solids. Not the material. Mechanics of material? No. Yeah. 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 Mechanics yeah. of solids. Don't we have a course named after that? Yeah, it's mechanics of material. Oh, who's teaching that? There's like a whole bunch. Yeah. I think that. <laughs> anyway, that, that, that happens to be one of the weak areas in this university where actually pool. Uh, but anyway, my, my point is, these guys were never trained in that kind of course, but, and I'll show you the design when we come to, when we come to it, they were able to design this very interesting space. Because eventually, the kind of frequency that you, you can detect depends on the stiffness of the spring. High frequency. So if you want to attach an accelerometer to a high frequency kind of uh, application, uh, for example, military application, or, case, or, like stuff, or a low frequency application, you want to have a vibration in the belly. Or if you're monitoring the health of uh, mechanical equipment, it's not low frequency. So that is controlled by the stiffness of the beam. Sometimes you need a very, very large beam. You can't fit it. So what do you do? You fold it into a accordion type of structure. So the, the original ones were not designed by any kind of things, actually. They were, uh, and then there's another one, the uh, outrigger. The beams are called outrigger kind of uh, beams. Uh, very interesting concept. Uh, so that's where I see design, innovative design approach uh, skills being done. Okay? So when I, when I, one thing I want you to do is when you look at these devices, I want you to look at them from a design point of view. Okay? Why is it folded that way? Could they have designed it in a different way? And this part of the training that uh, we'll be going through. Okay. Anyway, that's your accelerometer. <laughs> pressure gauge, pressure sensors, very easy, straightforward. Now, the green one represents actually, imagine at the beginning the whole thing was a green block. That's a silicon wafer. In fact, I came late and I, I didn't get a silicon wafer, so next time I come in, I'll bring you, uh, show you silicon wafers. Uh, very thin, 0.5 millimeter, 500 micron. Uh, but that's very deep. Actually. Because most of the features we're working on are on the uh, uh, 20 micron max. So what you do is you start with a silicon wafer, okay? 
Not even 500 micron, about 50 micron or 40 micron. Now, at the beginning, this thing was inverted, so I had a silicon wafer. Let me assume this is a silicon wafer. Then I put a socket in K, OH, potassium hydroxide, which is the base. So potassium hydroxide actually reacts with silicon, and it etches away the silicon. So the silicon gets covered to silicon dioxide and water and H2O, and then gets washed away. Now, remember I told you, the way it, it's etched is called anisotropic. Aniso means not the same in every direction. So what it does is it's going to etch it at 56.7 degrees. Okay? So invert this guy. If you invert, then you will see that it's going to be etched. So if you, make, if you measure the angle, it's 56.7. That is the reason. That's homework number zero or number one. Uh, Silicon is a crystalline structure, and the crystals are 56.7. Now, it depends on how you cut it. There's 100, 110, 111. And I'm going to post the homework by Sunday, uh, and I think it's due next week or the week after. Uh, so I want you to read about the crystalline structure of silicon. The reason why it's important is because it enables you to do this anisotropic etching, and it makes this beautiful trapezoidal hole. And if I keep it longer, it's just going to etch through the whole thing. But if I stop it at the right moment, I can get any thickness that I want for the membrane. And once you have that, it's interesting. Remember, we talked about it. Now we see a mechanical part. Now, in addition, what we do is there's a trick that we have to do. We dope it with phosphorus. And it turns out, if you take silicon and then you dope it with phosphorus at high temperature, then it becomes piezo resistive. Do you guys know what piezo resistive is? So piezo means in Greek. Change of resistance through mechanical strength. Not in Greek. Yeah, well, I mean, that's why it is. Uh, but piezo means uh, pressure, force. Resistive means you have, of course, a resistance, resistance, right? So piezo resistive means you apply mechanical blow to it, there is some changes. Piezo electric. There's another type of material property called piezo electric. Or piezo electricity. What's piezo electricity? Piezo is pressure. So what happens? If you apply pressure to the material, what happens to it? In a piezo resistive material, so you apply pressure, then the resistance changes, the electric resistance. But there is another group of materials for materials for piezo So what happens if you have that Anybody? Come on, guys. Let's is it going to change the, the distance from the two plates and make them closer or farther away? No, the one is right there. Piezo, electric. Piezo, pressure. Electric. The electric potential changes. Uh, so voltage happens. So that's how micro, uh, your microphone works. The speakers work. Right? With the speaker, actually, I mean, when you, when the, the way the speaker works, you're applying a mechanical load, you're speaking to it, uh, and then it vibrates, and that's turned into a voltage difference, mm -hmm. and that could be coded into a signal, and it goes through the airwaves, and then the other person listens to it, right? Very basic. So you have piezo resistive materials and piezo electric. So our assessment is the exact. So you need to know the difference between both of them. Now, in this particular case, what we have is you uh, bombard it. Uh, or dope it with phosphorus, then it becomes piezo resistant. What it means is you apply pressure, it deflects, then the resistance changes. Now, so it's like this. Uh, well, yeah, so it looks like this. So uh, this is the membrane, silicon membrane. This is a cross section, this is a top view. This is an actual device, actually. So what we have done is we have uh, taken this and covered everything else and put potassium hydroxide, then from the back. Uh, then it etched, and then we're left with uh, a membrane. So what you do is, uh, first, like I said, you uh, dope it with phosphorus, so it becomes, in the corners, you have a piezo resistivity type of material, I mean, uh, nature. In addition, what you do is, because you have to package it, right? So at the back side, you come in, and you put a package with just an opening, maybe a glass. 
but the opening is to let air in because it's a pressure gauge. So you let air in, then the pressure is applied and it deflects. Now, that piezo resistor material, PZT, detects that motion. Remember, deflection, therefore change in resistance. I cannot measure just change of resistance. I'm, I'm not interested in just change of resistance. Why I'm interested is the pressure, right? But I have to transduce this to a different magnitude, electrical quantity, MB495, Durali. So, what is that circuit that you use which converts change in resistance into change in voltage? Guys, this side has been very quiet. Right. Yeah, what's the circuit for it? Very good. Which one? Bridge. Remember high school guys? Are you dead now? So you have a Whitstone bridge uh, circuit, then it takes that, uh, converts it to change of voltage, then change of voltage is associated with the uh, change of pressure. Then I can make, measure my pressure, so it's a, just a calibration uh, chart. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so far, you know how an accelerometer works, you know how a pressure sensor works. Now, I, I'm talking about mass, okay? Any questions? Danny. So, you can see some of the uh, holes that we made, 56.7. Uh, in fact, I don't ask this in this club, but in the 685, if I keep it longer, then it's going to edge through it. But this guy, I kept it for shorter time, so the uh, it was etched shorter time, so it's shallower. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Huh? A what? Yeah, you just sock it. So you take a wafer and you put it in a KOH bath. Okay. I mean, there's something called, uh, of course, masking because you, if you don't want the other parts to be touched, uh, you want maybe hundreds of these guys. So you have one here, another here, another here, another here. But in the middle, we cover them with a material called protection material or sacrificial lead material. We'll come back to that later. But you can cover the other guys and then expose this to KOH. And at a given time, it will etch only that part. All right. Now, what's next? So, accelerometers, pressure sensors, optical. So, the optical mirrors, which I talked about uh, on projectors, actually look like this, okay? So, you're going to have a frame, uh, some kind of uh, support, and you're going to have these mirrors, which are supported on a hinge, like a beam, and what you do is, and this is where it becomes important, now, this mirror is engaged. When it's in a rest position, it's flat. Okay, the whole thing is covered. Sitting flat. Now, the mirror has a thin metal layer. Okay? Aluminum, platinum, gold, platinum. Now, at the bottom, here, on this side, you can't see it, I have another layer which is also conductive. Okay? So what happens is, if I put, so remember, at the beginning, this guy was just hanging out, it's flat. And at the bottom, I have a, another electrode. That connected, there's a wire, now I put voltage. If I put opposite voltage, then this guy is up. It's pulled down. And that's what happened here. So as soon as you put a bias between the two of them, then the mirror rotates. So when light comes in, Light is reflected. You know, the only thing mirror does is reflect light. Mm -hmm. Its only purpose is just reflect light or deflect. If you don't want to reflect it, remove the voltage. It goes down. You see these dots? Black. What do you think happened? So each of them is a pixel. Okay. So in, uh, in this part, particular cases, you know, for example, in the projector, you have a billion, so you have a billion, uh, no, a million. Well, some of them work depends. So sometimes you have the billion uh, pixels. So each of them is one mirror. 
each dot, each pixel being a mirror, uh, well, each mirror represents a pixel, the dark ones are actually represented by a mirror which is flat, unengaged. Okay? The other, the other ones, non black one, whatever you have uh, color, of course, there's a filter, so I'm not going to talk about the filter. Uh, first, it was white light. So it's, it's either on and off, right? So it's black or white. So the black one, no mirror. The white one, you have a mirror engaged, but later on, I'm going to apply a filter, so that's why you get the colors. But very straightforward. There's nothing to it. It's just a mirror being engaged and disengaged. As far as the uh, mirror, uh, uh, mirror MEMS are concerned, there are other types of uh, optical MEMS devices. Maybe I will mention one of them, depending on the mood in the class. Yeah. For those mirrors, do they go uh, a specific uh, degree of angle, or just it's, it's, it's about five, and then another point, and that's yeah, no, it's, it's about five degrees. degrees. Uh, it's about five degrees. What I mean is, is yeah. there a way that they control how much they want it to to go the angle? Uh, no, no, it's on and off, like I said. So it's either theta max or theta zero. And theta max turns out to be it's very small. I think you don't need it to go forty five degrees uh, because the amount of voltage that you need. So six eighty five, we talk about this. Uh, the physics is amazing. Like I told you, once you engage it. You need voltage to engage it. But once you've engaged it, you could go down. I could pull my voltage. Because there's a hysteresis. There's some energy stored. And right now, look, I can keep this light on for an hour. I'm not consuming that much power. When I'm consuming power is, <laughs> now you don't know it, but you cannot imagine how many layers are being switched right now. All kind of weird stuff is happening over there. <laughs> that, 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 that's when the voltage uh, consumption happens. But once it's engaged, then it pulls it back. Yes? So the things only rotate around a single? Uh, yeah, yeah, single axis, yeah. Single axis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, single axis. Uh, I have very interesting stories uh, about this, but Friday. <laughs> so there was a company called Oil Mem uh, that came to this town many, many years ago. Uh, and I've never seen such an accumulation of brain trust. Uh, you know, I hung out with some of my friends over here. Yeah, it's not. Now, don't say that. <laughs> uh, no, but these are the guys who built this. So that was a uh, funded, I mean, a startup company, and all the bright people working in uh, MEMS and all, I mean, they came in. Uh, but they refused. Uh, have you guys heard of a company called Cisco? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. So Cisco was actually uh, the Google of uh, 1998, 99. Uh, Cisco offered them $4 billion. $4 billion, 40 employees. So I don't Right now it's a coffee. I mean, I go there and I almost cry. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the CEO said, no, well, you know, we're, we're going to be Cisco ourselves. Uh, then anyway, within a year, I mean, the whole thing, uh, optical market went down, uh, but they did this. So this device was supposed to revolutionize the 5G stuff that you're talking about right now. It cannot be enabled unless you have these electrical switches, because right now, except that I, uh, all these guys, friends, and can you hear me now, and all that, uh, it's bad delayed because they're using electrical switches. Optical switch. Speed of light, much faster, uh, and it allows much uh, bandwidth. So, so a very, very interesting. Uh, <laughs> but as a market, I, you know, I need to tell you, uh, in terms of uh, switches, filters, inductors, conductors, and all that, uh, you can make these. Uh, the first device that we made in our lab was actually this humble RF switch. You know, one of the first students I graduated from about 15 years ago, so she did this. Uh, but uh, normally I don't cover a class with uh, Last point. Don't freak out. It's not chemistry. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing wrong in chemistry. Uh, remember I told you, uh, well, by the way, 
What, what, what group is silicon? So remember, last week we talked about this. So a note, I mean, a MEMS class requires knowledge from different areas, right? So one of them, of course, is So and I'll tell you why it's important that silicon is right here. Group four, right? Uh, yeah, uh, now, there are two types of uh, periodic table. Of course, one is the uh, semiconductor by the other the chemistry. Uh, it's called four, yeah, four, uh, group 4 uh, uh, chemist and group 14 semiconductor. But anyway, cop, uh, uh, carbon and silicon are the same group. group four. Now, if I take silicon and dope it with phosphorus, which is a group 5, okay? Uh, well, yeah, but anyway, if I take phosphorus and bombard silica with phosphorus, why do you think I'm a school of silica? Now, it's a very clear, that's why I tell you. That's why you guys went to high school, by the way. My son still asks me why, why does he have to go to high school? What happens? Right. Yeah, so, what, so the group, as you go to the right hand side, you have excess of electrons on the outer shells, right? So these, the, the uh, elements on the right hand side have more electrons than the left. So you take phosphorus and bombard uh, silicon, then you have excess type of silicon, I mean, excess electrons of silicon. So silicon becomes N N okay? So excess of electrons. Now, the same silicon, if I bombard it with aura B on the left side of the periodic table, what happens? It becomes B type, which means it's knocking off the electrons. And electron engineers have this weird concept called holes. The absence of electrons. Okay? So what happens is, and you need to know this, I didn't write anything today. <coughs> <laughs> so I take silicon, I come from the top, bombard it with phosphorus, then I get n-type, right? 